Good morning and welcome. Glad to have you all here this morning. My name is Mark Thomas. I'm one of the partners here in the Raleigh office of Williams Mullen. And I am happy to welcome you to this program on practical implications for employers of the Affordable Care Act. It's been three years this month since the statute was enacted. And at that time, many of its requirements clearly seemed to be distant threats or oncoming duties. And there were still questions in the minds of many people at that time as to whether it would ever come to pass. But after the decision of the US Supreme Court last June, which upheld the constitutionality of the statute, and after the election last November, which confirmed that the White House was not going to be stopping the implementation of the statute, and after the growing flood of regulations which have been issued in recent months and weeks to implement the statutory requirements, the reality of these requirements has become all too clear to the people out in the business community. And so for those employers and the people, like many of you who advise them, uh, it is important to seize the issues and try to come to terms with what they require in each employer's particular situation and to understand how the statute and the regulations are going to be uh, changing or impacting how the employer offers benefits to the employee workforce. We have some very well-qualified speakers today to bring those issues to you and to give you some guidance and practical uh, solutions and answers for many of those questions. Our first speaker is going to be Bryden DeWitt, who is a partner at Williams Mullen. Bryden's practice focuses on all areas of employee benefits law, including qualified pension plans, welfare plans, HIPAA compliance, which has a dimension for the Affordable Care Act, stock-based compensation, and benefits issues arising out of mergers and acquisitions. Uh, Bryden is based in Richmond, but is also actively involved in the work here in our Raleigh office. He and Robert Shaw and I are the employee benefits team for Williams Mullen here in Raleigh and the Triangle. Our second speaker is Brian Bickley, who is the Vice President for Employee Benefits at Scott Insurance. Brian brings 18 years of experience in the employee benefits industry to his remarks today, and he has played a key role in developing Scott Benefit Services strategic initiatives. Scott Benefit Services is a regional employee-owned independent agency which serves the needs of mid-market clients for risk management and insurance services. So you have two very well-informed speakers here. We are going to ask you to reserve your questions toward the end of the program. We will be going until 10 o'clock, and about 9.45, we will begin our Q&A period, and we invite you to take advantage of the two speakers that we have today to raise any questions that you want to consider or have them address in this field. With that as background, I'm going to ask uh, Brian DeWitt to come forward and to speak to the legal dimensions of this very complex and challenging area. Good morning. Uh, as Mark mentioned, it has, it's hard to believe here we are in, in March of 2013. The Affordable Care Act was signed on March 23, 2010. And since, I guess, now for almost three years, I've been giving talks like this. And the reaction I usually receive from the audience is, well, that's really complicated, but it's not really going to happen, right? And uh, there was thinking that the Supreme Court would overturn the, the act. And then last summer, that didn't happen. Um, and there was a flurry of activity. And you know, what does this mean? And it was almost as if the act had just been signed in 2012, the summer of 2012. And then that kind of calmed down. And the thinking was, well, Romney will win the election and the Republicans will sweep the Senate and the, the act will be repealed. It's not really going to happen. And of course, that didn't happen. And so here we are. Um, the future is now. The, the Affordable Care Act, the fundamental changes um, under the act are going to happen in, in a few short months, in 2014. Uh, until now, what we have seen are you know, really the, some of the changes that really don't impact our lives and the way we deliver health insurance uh, that much. They've been benefit reforms, you know, coverage of adult children to age 26, um, requirement to cover preventive services, re elimination of lifetime limits, pre-existing condition exclusions, et cetera. Um, but really in 2014 is where we 
get the fundamental change uh, to the way that health insurance is provided in the United States. Um, these next few slides really are not going to be a surprise to anyone if you happen to purchase health insurance, which probably you do. Um, we've been seeing uh, steady increases in, in the cost of health insurance. Um, the, the change from 2011 to 2012 was a little bit less than it had been in prior years. Um, but according to an Aon Hewitt analysis in 2013, they expect in health insurance rates to go up 6.3%. Um, um, the average cost of providing health coverage to an employee, and this is taking into account employees who elect self-only coverage and those who elect family coverage, <clears throat> has been on a steady increase since 2007. Um, it's projected that this year the cost to an employer of providing health insurance to an employee on average will be $11,188. Pretty expensive. The amount that we're requiring employees to contribute to purchase health insurance is also, likewise, you know, obviously increasing um, by almost $1,000 annually from 2007 to 2013. So costs keep rising. And so what will the Affordable Care Act do once we get this fully implemented in 2014? And of course, the responses are all over the board. Um, the, the CEO of Aetna thinks that some markets are going to go up by a 100% increase in, in insurance. Um, in response to that, Gary Claxton of the Kaiser Family Foundation said that's ridiculous. We're not going to see those increases. The Obama administration has consistently uh, said that families going to receive, are going to feel a $2,300 reduction. Um, but the uh, Congressional Budget Office, CBO itself, has, has estimated increases of 10 to 13%. So, I think it's safe to say, uh, with, given all the uncertainty, one thing we know for sure is that the cost of providing health insurance and purchasing health insurance is you know, likely going to keep going up. So again, here we go to come to 2014, and we have the fundamental change in the way that health insurance is provided. There are really two sides to this, right? You have the employer mandate. Um, large employers are required to provide minimum essential coverage that provides minimum value and is affordable. And if they fail to do so uh, for their full-time employees, they're going to face penalties. The other, other side of this, the other wing, I guess, is that in individuals are going to be required to purchase health insurance either from their employer, um, from a state or federal exchange, health insurance exchange, or Medicaid or Medicare, um, or face an individual penalty. And the individual penalty is what the Supreme, the majority of what the Supreme Court case was about last summer as, as to whether that was constitutional. So individuals, we are all required to purchase, purchase insurance. Large employers are required to offer insurance. Uh, the individual penalty in 2014, uh, it, it's phased in um, in 2014, that $95 or 1% of household income, that's the annual penalty. So if you think back a couple slides, the cost of providing of, for an employee to purchase insurance was $2,300. Uh, but if you fail to do that, then you're going to pay $95 or 1% of household income. So if your income, you know, if an employee whose income is $40,000, uh, they have a choice between $400 uh, or $2,300 if, if they're inclined not to purchase health insurance for other reasons. So that's the individual mandate. Of course, our focus today is the employer mandate. As I mentioned, the, the idea is that in 2014, I'm sure everyone has heard, you know, it's, it's been in the news a lot, uh, is that insurance will be offered through a state exchange. The, the act contemplated that every state would set up a health insurance exchange. Uh, this is a, can be a governmental entity or quasi-governmental private entity that, that regulates the health insurance market in the state. It qualifies plans or health insurance coverage as being um, compliant with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, they set up a website with um, coverage at different levels, the bronze, gold, silver, and, and platinum levels of coverage. Uh, the idea is employee, or individuals can go onto the website, uh, compare, kind of like you do on Travelocity or Expedia, you know, and, and select your health insurance. Um, the only problem is 26 states have refused to um, set up a state exchange. The states in yellow have refused to set up an exchange. The light blue states have decided to do a federal state partnership exchange, and that's really a federal exchange where the state assumes some of the responsibilities. And the dark blue states are the ones who are setting up their own exchange. 
Um, so it's going to be really interesting. The, the Department of Health and Human Services has said they weren't really prepared to uh, to run 26, and really, if you add the seven, uh, was it 33 um, state exchanges, and yet the Affordable Care Act doesn't really work in 2014 unless we have these exchanges. So that's where we are on the, on the exchange side. Uh, but for employers in 2014, again, if you are an applicable large employer, uh, you'll owe an accessible payment. These are terms of art. If the employer does not offer minimum essential coverage or the employer offers coverage, uh, but the coverage is not does not provide minimum value or is not affordable. And um, any full-time employee goes to an exchange and receives premium assistance. Um, individuals will be, will be eligible for premium assistance through an exchange if their income is below 400% of the federal poverty line, which is actually a pretty high number. So a lot of people will be eligible for assistance through an exchange. So again, uh, the employer will be subject to a penalty if you don't provide coverage or you provide inadequate coverage and one of your employees goes to an exchange and purchases coverage and receives premium assistance. And you know, I keep telling people, you know, this is it's kind of like learning a new language. Uh, when these regulations came out, these pay or, or player pay regulations, um, this used to be one of my slides in my Affordable Care Act presentation, and now it's become an entire <laughs> entire seminar. Um, and it's like a different language. It's 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 in the benefit world, I guess it's in a really, it's in the Romance languages. Uh, it's like French and Spanish, um, but it is a little bit of a different language. And so there are some key concepts to really understand the player pay rules. And the first, of course, is whether you are or whether the employer is an applicable large employer. Um, a, a large employer is one that employed at least 50 full-time employees in the prior calendar year. Okay, so it's not the current year payroll, it's the payroll in the prior year. And that is, um, that means that 2013 payroll, this year's payroll, is going to determine whether employers are applicable large employers subject to these requirements in 2014. And the way you, you do this is kind of pretty simple. You go back, so in 2014, we're going to look at, back at every month in 2013, add up the number of full-time employees in every each month, um, figure out the number of full-time equivalent employees, which I'll describe in a moment, and get that total for the month, add up all the months, and divide that sum uh, by 12. And if you if the result is 50 or more, then the employer is an applicable large employer for the year. For full-time equivalent employees, um, you know a lot of employers are trying to avoid the application or avoid being an applicable large employer by reducing uh, the hours uh, employees from to get them under 30 hours. Well, those employees, even, even if they're part-time employees, are going to be taken into account uh, for determining whether an employer is an applicable large employer. So you take all of the hours, the aggregate hours of service, up to 120 hours per employee of non-full-time employees for a month. You aggregate all of those hours and divide by 120, and the result there is the number of full-time equivalent employees for the month. And so you add that number to your number of full-time employees, and that's the number you use for determining whether the employer is a, an applicable large employer. Uh, so here's an example. XYZ company, they have 20 full-time employees. These are employees who work 30 hours a week or 130 hours a month. And they have 40 non-full-time employees who work 90 hours per month. So you would multiply 40 times 90, you get 3,600, 3, divide that by 120, and this XYZ company has 30 full-time employees for the month. You add that to the 20 full-time employees, and they're at 50. All right? Uh, this is an example. This is one of my clients. Uh, it's, a, it's a restaurant at the beach, and it gives you an example of, and I can't move from the podium because we're recording, but if you look on this top line, uh, this is the number of full-time employees that they have. These are employees that they know worked at least 30 hours per week or 130 hours per month. And then they took all of their uh, part-time hours, and that's the total with their part-time hours in line B. They divided that by 120, and you add uh, line A and line C together, and that's the bottom line is their total for every month. And so for this employee, they were right, they're right on the line. Um, the sum total is 586 
a 0.7, you divide that by 12, and they came out at 48.9. So they, using their 2012 numbers, um, they were right under the 50 employee threshold. Um, for 2014 and 2014 only, there is a transition rule that provides employers some relief. Uh, they can determine their large employer status by using any six months in 2013 to determine their status. And so if you go back to this, to my client, um, we ran the numbers again using January to June because they are, again, a restaurant at the beach. So you can see that they have a lot of seasonal employees that, you know, this time of year they don't have so many um, employees. We get to April and then May, June, the summer months, it really spikes. So by working, just using January to June, the number came out when we did the math to 45 employees. So that gave them a little bit more of a buffer. So for 2013, uh, using just the six months, it gave them some relief. And again, these are their 2012 numbers. So they're looking at this and trying to make sure that their payroll, they want to stay under 50. Uh, so they're going to try to make sure that their payroll doesn't exceed uh, these numbers this year, the 2012 numbers in 2013. And there's also an exception for seasonal workers. If the only reason an employer's average number is goes above 50 is that for 120 days or less or four months or less, they had seasonal workers, um, then the employer is not an applicable large employer. Um, the regulations um, specifically say that retail workers are deemed to be seasonal workers. It also references a definition um, in current Department of Labor regulations that basically means that says that these are workers that the, the type of work that they do is only done during certain seasons of the year. Um, and until we get more guidance, uh, employers can use a good faith interpretation of what a seasonal worker is. Um, the other thing that I've been saying for three years is, you know, we don't have all the answers because we don't have the guidance yet, right? Um, these rules that I'm describing are in proposed form. So 2014 is approaching, and the best we have right now are uh, proposed regulations. So to give you an example of a seasonal worker, uh, this is a retailer. Uh, they have 40 full-time employees every month of the year. And so if you only counted their full-time employees, they would not be a, an applicable large employer. Um, but they have 80 seasonal full-time employees um, leading up to and through the Christmas season. So September, October, November, December, their employee number spikes uh, 200, 120 employees. And if you don't take into account the seasonal worker exception, this would, this employer would be an applicable large employer because they're at 66.5 full-time employees. But the only reason that you get to 66.5 is that they had those 80 seasonal workers during four months out of the year. So you disregard those employees. And by using the seasonal worker exception, um, this employer would not be an applicable, applicable large employer. Again, because the only reason their numbers exceeded 50 is that they had seasonal workers for four months out of the year. Um, however, if you take the same facts and suppose this employer had 20 full-time equivalent employees in August, so in August they had 60 employees, now that's five months out of the year that they exceeded 50 employees. And so the employer would not be able to take advantage of the seasonal worker exception, and the employer would be an applicable large employer because they went above 50 employees for more than four months. Um, it was five months, including August. Another important concept here is that the determination of whether an employer is an applicable large employer is done on a controlled group basis. And, and we use the rules that we use for purposes of 401k plans and, the, and qualified uh, pension plans. If you have a parent subsidiary control group, and that's where a parent owns at least 80% of the equity of the subsidiary, uh, the parent and the subsidiary would be treated as one employer under the control group rules. They would be a control group. And then there's a brother, sister control group where five or fewer persons own a controlling interest um, in, all the, in, in several organizations. And then there are also affiliated service groups. So if you are a member of a control group, you do this math based on the entire group and not on an entity by entity basis. So for example, a company P for parent um, owns 100% of the equity of companies S and T. Uh, P only has three, three full-time employees. Uh, company S has 40 and company T has 60. 
so if you looked at these companies individually, only company T would be an applicable large employer. But because of the control group rule, um, this entire group has 103 full-time employees, and P and S and T are all applicable large employers. So P has to comply, and S has to comply with the Affordable Care Act uh, because they are a member of a control group that has over 50 full-time employees. Interestingly, though, when you look at compliance as to whether penalties are owed, each entity is tested separately. So you look at all the entities together to determine whether you are um, subject to the Affordable Care Act, but then as far as compliance, uh, P, S, and T can all have different compliance strategies. So if T is out of compliance, S will not owe a penalty if S is compliant. Okay, so what is a full-time employee? A full-time employee is uh, an employee who for any calendar month works on an average of 30 hours per service per week. And if you work, if an employee works 130 hours in a month, uh, the employee is deemed to be, also deemed to work 30 hours per week. Um, hours of service, the proposed regulations, again, borrow from the 401k world. Um, it's each hour for which an employee is paid for actually performing duties, and also um, hours uh, paid time off, vacation, jury duty, um, paid leave of absence, holiday illness. Um, so all the, those are the hours that we consider for purposes of um, compliance. Um, in counting hours of service for hourly employees, you have to use the actual hour method, right? And that's fine because an hourly employee is, 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 is clocking in and clocking out. We can keep track of their actual hours. For salaried employees, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, we can use uh, the actual hours method, uh, but there are also equivalencies, again, borrowing from the ERISA rules for, for uh, qualified uh, pension plans. Um, if an employee, you can use the equivalency where if an employee works at least one hour in a day, they're deemed to have worked eight. Um, or if they work uh, one hour in a week, they're deemed to work 40 hours. Um, you can use different methods for different uh, reasonable classifications of employees. Uh, and you can change your methods on an annual basis as to how you're, you're calculating uh, hours. Um, one caveat, however, is that you cannot use an equivalency if it would understate an employee's hours. So, for example, suppose you had a, an employee who works three days a week, 10 hours a day. So that employee would work on the, under the actual hours method 30 hours and, and would be a full-time employee. Uh, if you use the day's work equivalency for that employee, they would only be credited with 24 hours. And so that would not be permissible. Uh, so you can't use an equivalency if it would understate um, an employee's hours of service. All right, so we've gotten to the point where we know what an applicable large employer is and we know what a full-time employee is. Um, so we have an employer who's an applicable large employer. Uh, the employer must offer minimum essential coverage uh, to employees. And basically, we're, we're still going to get some more guidance on this, but basically it's an offer of employer-sponsored group health plan that complies with the Affordable Care Act uh, benefit mandates. Um, this coverage must be offered to dependents. Um, if you do not offer, if you offer coverage to a full-time employee but do not cover the employee's dependents, then you don't get credit for, for covering that full-time employee. Um, coverage must be offered for an entire month in order to be deemed to have given offered coverage to an employee for a month. And again, the, the penalties are calculated on a month-by-month -month basis. Uh, there is a grace period or a grace rule here where if you cover at least 95% of your full-time employees, uh, you're deemed to have covered, you, you've deemed to comply with the uh, minimum essential coverage requirement if you offer this coverage to at least 95% of your full-time employees. Uh, the coverage that you provide uh, must provide minimum value, and basically that means it covers at least 60% of benefit costs. And we're, again, we're also waiting for regulations on this. Uh, but the way that I best understand it, and maybe Brian can, can, can correct me, but if I go to the doctor and I have a $100 procedure, my insurance needs to cover 60. You know, so after I pay my deductible, my copay, and coinsurance, um, that can't be greater than $40. The insurance needs to be covering at least 60. And this will be tested on a plan-wide aggregate basis. And we're supposed to have a uh, online calculator from the HHS and, and IRS to help uh, employers determine whether their plans are compliant with the minimum value rule. And then the plan has to be affordable. 
Um, you cannot require a full-time employee uh, to pay more than 9.5% of household income for their insurance. Um, it's pretty much impossible for an employer to know household income. That's not the income you're paying to an employee. Uh, that would be all of the income coming you know, from spouse uh, into, the, into the household. So the regulations provide three safe harbors. Um, first is the W-2 safe harbor where you, you do the 9.5% test based on the box one uh, W-2 wages. The second is a rate of pay safe harbor, and that's where you take the, the employee's hourly rate of pay at the beginning of the plan year and multiply it by 130, and that gives you the monthly amount that you use to uh, do the 9.5% test. And then the third safe harbor is the Federal Poverty Line safe harbor, and that's where you use the most recently announced Federal Poverty Line numbers uh, immediately prior to the beginning of the plan year and use that to, to run your test. So some quick examples. Uh, suppose Andy, he works uh, all of 2014, and we require him to pay $100 per month to, to purchase health insurance. His box uh, one wages are $24,000. Uh, then Andy's coverage would be affordable because $1,200 is only, if I'm done, done my math right, is only 5% of $2,400. Um, here's someone who's only employed for nine months. Um, his cost of coverage, again, is $100 per month. His wages are $18,000 on, on his W-2. And this coverage is affordable because $900 is only 5% of $18,000. This one's a little bit trickier. Uh, Candace uh, is employed from May through December, so she's employed for eight months out of the year. Uh, her coverage is not offered, however, until August. So she's covered for five months, five of the eight months that she was employed for the year. Her wages for the year are $15,000. In this case, you um, multiply her box one wages by a fraction, the months she was offered coverage over the total months that she was employed for the year. So in, in Candace's case, that would be five-eighths. And that gives you the number you use would be $9,375. The amount she was required to pay for coverage was 500. She was covered for five months at $100 per month. And her coverage is affordable because $500 is less than 9.5% of $9,375. On the rate of pay formula, some examples. Um, David, if you notice, we have A, B, C, D here. Um, David is employed all of 2014. He's charged $85 per month. At the beginning of the plan year, uh, his wages were $7.25 per hour. So the monthly number we can use for him is $942.50, 130 times $7 uh, and a quarter. And the coverage is affordable because $85 is 9.01% of 942 50 um, again, Eve um, is employed only part of the year. Cost of coverage is $100 per month. She's paid $10 an hour from May to October. And then in, from November to December, she gets a raise of $2 per hour, up to $12. Uh, the employer cannot take advantage of the increase in, in Eve's wages. Again, you, can, you only use the rate of pay at the beginning of the plan year. So the number used to test um, uh, Eve is $1,300, $10 times 130, and not $12. Um, so the raise is not taken into account. And in this case, the coverage would be affordable. All right. So beginning in 2014, the employer shared responsibility requirement kicks in. Um, if the employer does not offer minimum essential coverage and one full-time employee or at least, at least one full-time employee goes to an exchange and receives uh, premium assistance coverage, uh, then the penalty is $167 times the number of full-time employees in excess of 30. Um, this is the $2,000 penalty, because that works out on an annual basis to $2,000 uh, per employee. If the employer offers minimum essential coverage, but it fails the minimum value test, that's the 60% test we discussed, or it fails the affordability test, the 9.5% test that we just discussed. Then the employer would owe a penalty of $250 uh, per month times the number of full-time employees who go to an exchange and receive coverage. So if the employer at least offers minimum essential coverage, 
uh, then the penalty is only based on the number of employees who decide to purchase coverage through an exchange and receive premium assistance. If an employer doesn't offer any coverage, then if one employee goes to an exchange, the employer owes a penalty based on all full-time employees in excess of 30. So it's a, the top, the first one is a greater penalty than if, if coverage is offered. And this is where it gets even more interesting. So we, we determine how to calculate the number of employees for, for purposes of determining whether the employer is subject to the act. But now we have to forget that, okay? So now we look, if we're determining what our penalty would be and which full-time employees we have to cover, there's a different method in the proposed regulations for doing that. And that's what we're going to discuss now. It's a look-back measurement period coupled with a going-forward stability period. So under this method, the employer looks back or, and the employer can select the duration of the period, either three to 12 months, in a look-back measurement period. And so you look back to the look-back measurement period and you identify which employees work 30 hours a week, which employees are the full-time employees. And then in the going forward stability period, the employees identified as full-time in the look-back period must be treated as full-time employees in the going forward stability period. And so it doesn't matter if we decide that Brian, is a, he worked 30 hours a week in our look-back period, then for our entire stability period going forward, Brian will be treated as a full-time employee eligible for coverage, even if he drops to 25 hours per week. All right, I'm starting to run out of time. So you identify who they are, and then you treat them as full-time employees going forward. For new employees, if you hire a new employee and you know that this is a, you're hiring them on a full-time basis, there's no penalty if you do not provide coverage for up to three months. But after three months, the full-time employee must be covered. For new seasonal employees or employees for whom, with whom you're not really reasonably sure whether they're going to be working full-time, you can have a going forward initial measurement period of up to three to 12 months, and then a stability period going forward after that. So you're allowed to, you're not penalized if it's a variable hour or seasonal, seasonal worker if you do not provide coverage during this initial measurement period. So you give them time to establish whether they're full-time or not. But after that initial measurement period, you must treat them as full-time employees in a subsequent stability period. And then there's an optional administrative period to actually enroll them. So the administrative period Go, runs from between the end of the measurement period and the beginning of the stability period. Um, for an ongoing employee, so your current employees who are full-time employees, um, you could have, let's say you have a calendar year plan year. The plan year begins January 1, and you have open enrollment in October. And so for your ongoing employees, you could have a measurement period, look back measurement period, that get, runs from October to October. So every October, you identify, using your look-back measurement period, which employees were full-time employees um, during that measurement period. Then you could have your open enrollment period for January 1, and then your stability period could begin January 1, and you treat the employees identified during your look-back period as eligible and full-time employees during your going-forward stability period. So this is going to require plans to be amended. I mean, most of our plans with our clients if they cover only full-time employees, first they'll identify full-time employees as working 32 hours a week or 35 hours per week, and that's no longer compliant. And then they also say that if you drop out, if you change classifications and drop from uh, you know, full-time to part-time, uh, you'll get COBRA, but you'll lose coverage. That is no longer allowed. Um, going forward in 2014, it has to be, if you are identified as a full-time employee in the, in the look-back measurement period, then you are eligible for coverage for the entire stability period or the entire plan year. And then there are some transition rules. Um, if you have a fiscal year plan year, um, you know, the, Williams Mullen has a July 1 plan year. So elections made this July will be in effect until July or J June 30th of 2014. As of January 1, we might have employees enrolled. So if an employee um, would be eligible for the plan based on the eligibility rules in effect last December and is offered coverage as of the first day of the plan year beginning in 2014, 
then there's no penalty for not covering the employee. Um, if there are employees who currently are not eligible, but the plan uh, um, offered coverage to at least a quarter of the employees, or at least, or, or provided coverage to at least a quarter of your employees, or at least a third of the employees were offered coverage under the plan, and then you get them enrolled in, in 2014, then there's no penalty for those employees. Uh, there's a cafeteria uh, transition rule for cafeteria plans that have a 20, that have a fiscal year beginning in 2013. Uh, that allow mid-year election changes for people to either, if they decide in 2014 they want to drop coverage and go to an exchange, or they decide they want to enroll in the employer's coverage uh, once the individual mandate kicks in, they are allowed to make a mid-year election change. This is only for 2014, and plans have to be amended by the end of 2014 to, to make this happen. They can be amended retroactively. And then there's a uh, measurement period transition rule that for purposes of using your look-back period, uh, for 2014 only, an employer can use a six-month look-back period instead of a 12-month period. And the IRS also realizes that some plans may not uh, provide coverage for dependents, and so there's no penalty in 2014 if the employer is actively taking steps uh, to provide coverage for dependents in 2014. All right, now completely switching gears. This is something that Brian wanted me to bring up. Um, there's a a transitional reinsurance program. It's a temporary program that's going to be in effect for 2014 to 2016. Uh, the government realized that PAPACA might have some impact on the individual insurance market um, and make it difficult for insurers. And so this is a, uh, the idea here is to provide funding uh, for the government to provide assistance to insurers. Insurance carriers must pay to the fee and self-insured plans must pay the fee. Uh, the TPAs for a self-insured plan are not on the hook for this, although TPAs can be used uh, to pay the fee. Um, the fee is based on the number of covered lives in the major medical plan, and it's based, you know, covered life times the national contribution rate for the year, um, which for 2014 will be $5.25 per month um, per covered life. So this is something self-insured plans really need to pay attention to to make sure they're, they're paying this fee and coordinate with their TPAs. And so, what does all this mean going forward? I, I saw an interesting survey from Taris Watson, um, and they asked employers, you know, are you going to be offering health insurance in 2014? And three, only 3% said that it was likely that they would discontinue coverage in 2014 or 2015. 45% um, of employers said they were somewhat to very likely to offer a plan to only a portion of their workforce and send other employees to an exchange. And what I thought was really, really the first one and the third one I think are really interesting. The third. Um, only 23% were confident that they would be offering health benefits in 10 years. And in, when this was asked in 2007, 73% um, of employers said they are confident that they would be offering coverage in 10 years. And I think what you're seeing here is, you know, if um, you know, the reason employers offer health insurance is to attract and retain employees, is to compete in the marketplace for employees with other employers. And so very few employers are going to, you know, get rid of their coverage and send employees to an exchange in 2014. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty about what the future holds. And given the rising cost of health insurance and perhaps an acceptance of the idea of purchasing coverage through an exchange, um, it's interesting that only 23% of employers are really confident that they'll continue coverage um, in 10 years. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian. And uh, hopefully I can... Ah, did it. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Good morning, everybody. I think you'll see a little bit of crossover, but hopefully we can skip through some of the real overview slides quickly and then talk specifics about how to do some of the measurement things that Brian's talking about. Um, so our job really, I mean, this is not unlike the real world, I guess, for Bryden to kind of interpret the law and then we're supposed to kind of come in and, and deal with our clients and kind of help them uh, implement them and, and stay compliant. Um, so that's kind of, you know, the way things are going to go this morning. Um, I tell you, we work just, so we're, we're working with specific clients to kind of make this happen, implement things properly, be compliant, that kind of thing. And, I don't often get to sort of aggregate those results, so just take a minute to kind of give you an overview of kind of what we're hearing. You know, we work with uh, with clients that range from about a hundred to several tens of thousand um, range of employees, 
And, you know, over the past two years, there's been a lot of work on just education, education, education. Um, and I think, um, you know, now it's really how do we do this in a way, uh, in a thoughtful way. And I think what most people are surprised about is that really now is you're almost behind the eight ball in terms of doing some things that uh, you need to do to get ready for 2014. Um, you know, and, and a lot of that is what we'll sort of talk about. But you can imagine that most people are um, are kind of comfortable with the testing concept that Bryden talked about, and I'll touch on uh, briefly. Um, you know, and, and so the people that are scratching their head the most right now are the people that have a large, flexible workforce. Uh, there's staffing companies, there's retail companies, there's companies that owns own hotels and things like that, and um, you know they've been so much of uh, or so used to sort of parsing their employees out into different classes. You know, this is my full-time folks, kind of my core, and then here's my part-time, and all that's kind of be becoming a little bit muddy. So those are the people who are having the hardest time with this. And then I think the second group would be the smaller companies that are probably down to 50 employees up to about 300 employees who are uh, entrepreneurial kind of people. They get frustrated with all these rules and regulations. The demographics of the types of people that they're hiring are a young, energetic workforce. And then they're seeing all these rules being put on them and they're just, you know, they want to fight it. So just in our world, there is a, a rash of those types of people um, and they're going to be punished, you know, quote unquote, punished the most in terms of health care reform, both through underwriting provisions. They're going to, going to get hit harder uh, when underwriting uh, regs sort of uh, meld and you can't really reward, you know, young, healthy groups as much as you currently can. Um, and with also some of the taxes that Bryden touched on, um, that transitional reinsurance fee, it sounds like a self-funded uh, concept, but fully insured uh, plans have to pay that as well. On top of that, fully insured plans have to pay an industry fee, um, which in North Carolina for Blue Cross clients is about 2.5%. So those, those kinds of companies are looking at this saying, look, I, you know, this, this is something that I want to kind of run away from. So all of a sudden, you've got this rash of those types of companies that are looking to, to move to a self-funded, partially self-funded environment to get away from some of these rules, like minimum coverage standards, like those taxes and fees that we're talking about, and the underwriting provisions that we're talking about. So um, at the end, I do actually have, um, we're one of 37 agencies in the country that works with Milliman, the largest healthcare actuary in the country. You, uh, and, and what I wanted to pass out, um, because all of my clients' boards are asking for this, what's the cost of, you know, Papaka over the past several years? So I've got sort of a generic, large, non-grandfathered company and kind of by year what all the cost implications are. And it, and it looks like little, you know, 0.03 percent, and but you go over the years, over the over the two, uh, well, really the four-year period because it takes you through 2014, and it's about seven percent on top of what you would normally pay in terms of health care. So, I'll um, I'll pass those out at the end. So moving forward, I you know I wanted to talk a little bit about um, why we're doing this. Why are we counting all of employees and and the other thing I'll say, and I mentioned this to Mark, um, that one of the provisions was that, that employers were required to do was to tell your employees this month, actually, that these health care exchanges, these state-based exchanges are coming, okay? And, um, and that, that provision was actually pushed sort of an indefinite period to the fall or some period after that. So. You know, when Bryden showed that state map, that United States map that showed 26 states saying, look, we're not going to put these exchanges together, that puts the onus back on the, on the, uh, the federal government. And as we all know, the federal government's, you know, rambling with, uh, with some other issues right now. And so there are some rumblings out there. This is just my personal opinion and, and talking to some pretty high-level government affairs people 
there are rumblings that the, uh, the state exchanges could be pushed out to 2015. But <clears throat> that being said, the law right now says they're 2014 up and running. So we have to work towards be, you know, being compliant with that. So the first thing I'd say is, you know, why are we doing all this counting stuff? And, and, and one of the provisions is, if Brian Bryden mentioned, that if you're not a calendar year medical plan, let's say you're a July plan like Williams Mullen is, these penalties will take effect January 1st unless you're compliant with these counting rules. So the main thing to focus on is are you offering, um, offering medical coverage to at least 95% of your eligible employees? And if the answer is yes, then you get to kind of waive those fees or not really look at those fees until July 1st, which is your plan year. That's the first thing. And the second thing is the reason we're looking at the fees or the, the numbers so strongly um, is like Bryden said that if you don't offer health care coverage in 2014, government's got to have a number to multiply by for that fee, that $2,000 fee per person. So that's kind of what we're looking for. So again, this is a, this is a repeat, but very quickly, um, this is what happens on the employer side. So um, very quickly, you know, do you offer a group health plan and do you have more than 50 full-time equivalent employees? Um, and does at least one of your employees make between 100% of the federal poverty level and 400% of federal poverty level? And we're going to look at what those numbers are. I think they're important to know. Um, and do you fail one of the following tests? Is your coverage less than 60% actuarial value? And we'll talk about what that, that means, but Bryden was exactly right. It's basically if we aggregately went out to purchase health care, hospital, uh, inpatient, outpatient, surgeries, office visits, pharmacy, that kind of thing, collectively our plan would have to cover 60% of our cost. 40% would come to us in terms of copays, out-of-pockets, that kind of thing. And do you charge any of your folks more than 9.5% of their income for that lowest cost coverage that you offer? So you may offer five plans to your employees. We're going to look at the lowest cost, I mean the lowest plan, and we're only going to look at the employee-only coverage. Okay, so that's key. So at this point, we're spending a lot of time helping people kind of walk through these last two bullet points. You know, do you pass those two tests? So very quickly, um, this kind of looks at things from the employee perspective, right? So I, as an employee, may be eligible to go into an exchange and receive a subsidy if I'm a taxpayer, and generally my, my pay is somewhere between 100% of federal poverty level or 400% of federal poverty level. We'll talk about those numbers in a second. And I'm not um, offered any sort of other acceptable coverage. An acceptable coverage could be your group health plan as long as you pass those two tests we just talked about. So for you all who actually interface with your employees or, or just you know folks in general, this is the choice that each employee is going to have to have to make. And this is what we, at the very end of this, I'll show you a, a, a slide that kind of represents the model that we run for our clients. But this is what every employee is going to have to kind of make a rational decision regarding this. So do I, do I stay on my employer's plan, okay? Do I waive coverage and pay that individual penalty? Do I buy coverage through an exchange or do I enroll in Medicaid if I'm eligible? You know, we talked about the federal poverty level guidelines. I think it's interesting just to put a number on that. Um, and I think it's surprising actually. So you can see this slide and we prepared this several months ago. Uh, most of our clients have employees in several states. So you're going to have to look at, you know, each state you have employees residing in uh, to look at these guidelines. But let's just speak, since we're sitting here, let's speak about North Carolina. North Carolina is at least going down the path of not expanding Medicaid. 
Um, so that 138 percent, the 138 percent column in the middle does not apply to North Carolina. So you can see that would have expanded Medicaid coverage. In other words, it would have been, become easier for me to qualify for Medicaid if North Carolina expanded at about $4,000 if I'm a person of a family of one. So essentially what we need to try to find out is how many of your employees earn between $11,170, and these are 2013 numbers. So this will probably pop up a little bit for next year. But for testing purposes, we're going to look at 2013. So how many of your employees actually earn between 11170 and 44680 So this is kind of go, goes back to that um, the affordability test that, that Bryden talked about. So essentially, our, our goal as employers, right, is to focus on what we can control. What we can control is do we offer at least one medical plan to our employee population? That's a 60% actuarial value plan. We'll talk about how you get there. And then we want to kind of focus on the cost of that coverage, employee-only coverage to our population. So here's what we're doing for clients. And this is kind of the, the process that you want to go through. So again, forget about part-time, full-time. Okay, I want to I want to look at a census of all of my employees. I don't care what you call them today, but I want to look at a census of all of my employees, and I want to figure out how much you paid them last year, um, and I want to look at the number of hours that they've worked. Okay, so we're going to try to figure out out of that basket of employees. So you got a you know you've got three thousand employees. How many of those 3,000 employees worked between third or worked more than 30 hours? Sorry, over this period of time that we're testing for, and who of those those employees earned between 100 and 400 percent of those federal poverty line numbers? Now that number from those two two bullets, <coughs> excuse me, is the number of potential subsidies. That's the number of my employees that could potentially go into an exchange. And that means I could potentially be charged $3,000 for each one that goes in there and picks up a subsidy. And then while I'm in there looking at a census, I kind of want to look at, you know, how much my, my people make. Um, so let's, you know, one sort of rule of thumb, and, and you know, we're in a practical, practical world, so let's kind of take the lowest um, wage that I pay and look at 9.5% of that number. Does that make sense so far? So this is a little bit of a confusing slide, but I want you to just kind of focus on that red box. That, those are the people we're trying to identify, right? I want to identify the people ma that make between 139, actually, take that back. And if I'm in, sitting in North Carolina, I want to look at the people that make 100% of federal poverty level to 400% of federal poverty level, and they pay more than 9.5% of their income towards my lowest cost employer plan, offered plan, right? So this is a sample output. We would do this for, for our clients. So this is a sample of the output from that analysis, right? So we've taken the census, figured out how many hours people worked, what they make, and what the cost of that, that, their coverage is. We take their, uh, their contribution strategy. In this specific example, we've come up with 375 people. If Medicaid is not expanded, like we don't think it's going to be in North Carolina, we've come up with 375 people that could potentially go into a state-based exchange and could I could potentially, therefore, pay a $3,000 penalty for each one of those folks, right, if I don't pass the affordability and the coverage test. So I've got a potential penalty. I'm looking at a million one twenty-five, but keep in mind I also continue to offer a health plan. So I've got all my health plan costs, um, and then I've got a potential penalty of a million one twenty-five for these people. So if Medicaid expands, you can see the number the number drops down of potential subsidies because it's a little bit harder to qualify for uh, for Medicaid. So the bucket becomes bigger. Um, or smaller, I'm sorry. So the potential penalty is actually smaller. 
So again, we're going to look at the, the affordability side of things too. So this is a, a, just another output of that analysis that we would do for, for our clients. And I think it's easiest just to kind of pop down to the, to the bottom. The, the, the black shaded area, you can see $85.33. That's the employee only contribution for the lowest priced plan that this employer offers its employees, right? $85.33. So we've tested that down to 9.5% of 100% of the federal, federal poverty level. And if you look at the bottom line, the, um, the, the, the minimum that can be, if you want to look at one of the safe harbor methods that Bryden mentioned, was to charge 9.5% of federal poverty level. And that gets you to $85.33 per month in its current federal poverty level form. So for a rule of thumb, if you wanted to do a safe harbor method for, for 2014, if you can keep your employee-only contribution below $88.43, you're good. You're safe from an affordability perspective. So back to, um, so we've talked about affordability. Now we have to talk a little bit about coverage. So we are back to looking at a 60% actuarial value plan. I will tell you that none of our clients offer below a 60% actuarial value plan, okay? So the norm, at least for um, sort of mid-market clients that, that, we're, you know, that we're working with, you're probably in a, still in the 83, 84% actuarial value. So if you just think about the math, you think about most plans, have an 80% coinsurance. They have some sort of deductible that uh, that you pay, and then you have an 80% coinsurance. So most plans are covering 80% plus a little bit for copays and things like that. So most plans are safe on this. Okay, where you start to get in trouble is when a, 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 an employer offers a high deductible plan. And the employee is paying for every health care service underneath that deductible, then we start to see in the high 60s. So this is the kind of testing that we're going to do for you every year. And basically, if you think about it, the way it's happening is you are, as health care costs continue to rise, you as the employer are painted into a little bit of a box. You know, so if your CFO or CEO comes into the room and says, okay. You know, we need you to hold costs this year or, or retain costs within, you know, 5%. And you're looking at a 10% medical plan renewal. Well, the first place to go is plan design. And the second place to go is what we charge our employees, contribution strategy. And on the plan design, if you're already at that 60%, you go, well, I can't really trim anymore and shift costs back to employees. And on the cost perspective, if you've already if you're already charging some of your folks more than nine and a half percent, you have to kind of weigh, well, how many are going to pay more than nine and a half percent? Because those people could go into the into the exchange and potentially I could be penalized on that number. So there's going to be a lot of I know I may be breaking the rules a little bit, but how much of a possible penalty am I looking at if I break the rules? And is that more or less in terms of what it would cost me to fix the plan design or fix the contribution strategy? So there's a lot of that kind of discussion going on. Can't really see this, but this is actually one of the calculators that is up and running now. This is the Health and Human Services actuarial value calculator. So essentially what you do <laughs> is you put in about 17 items on your health care plan. Um, and this thing, spit, it's, a, it's a little bit quirky still, but you may be able to see at the very bottom, it spits out a number for you, and then it kind of rounds up by 2%. <laughs> I'm not sure why it does that. But so in this example, um, we actually put in the, uh, the deductible levels, and, and there you can put in emergency room services and inpatient costs and things like that. This will spit out a number for you, and you may be familiar with these with these metal-based plans, right? So there's bronze, silver, gold, um, platinum. 
Um, and this one actually spit out the, the actuarial value at the bottom is 79.4%. So you know you're good. You're above the 60%, right? And then it's going to put you in one of these, these uh, metal tiers. For some reason, it rounds up two points. And so at 79.4%, you're in a gold tier, which is great. This is actually the output that we take. We take that calculator and put this in. So this is really the second page of that coverage of the, the cost estimator that we looked at the 9.5% the of the cost. This is actually the output from that same report that we use. So we would send this to a client and say, OK, you're good on the premium side, about on the 9.5% side. On this, in this example, you're good on the actuarial value side. You're coming out to 81.2%. You're actually offering your client a gold. So if we had the conversation with what are we going to do with cost for next year, this client actually has 21% 21, um, 21 that they could incrementally change their plan design and still be OK with the, uh, with the coverage rules. So we wanted to, we're getting a lot into, so, so it's, not, it's not too early to start thinking about um, you know, what Bryden was talking about there at the end was <laughs> determining who is a full-time you know, employee, right? So we think now's the time to start doing this. In, in fact, you're a little bit behind the eight ball. Um, but you know, I just wanted to kind of, kind of throw out a few recommendations. This is kind of you know, what we're walking our clients through. So the first part is kind of forget about what's, who, who you currently call full-time and part-time. Just sort of scrap that. And we've been talking about that for you know, a long time. But I want you to think about you know, when you're sitting down with an employee to hire them, to interview them, there, there needs to be some sort of, you know, some sort of predetermined, what is your intent? Is your intent to hire Christy as a full-time employee? If the answer is yes, then you go one direction when it comes to benefits. If your intent to hire Christy is to have her as a part-time employee, and again, the definition here of part-time is less than 30 hours, then you're going to go in a whole nother direction, right? Because if that's my intent with Christy, then I got to prove it. So it's a, it's a different mindset. So we, we want you to create a, a, a separate hiring practice you know, that, that walks through that says, OK, if I'm going to hire a full-time person, here's the, here's the proper protocol. If I'm hiring a, a, what, I would what I would call a part-time employee, here's the proper protocol and, and follow that. We want you to document that process and then stick with it. Um, we, we get this question a lot, you know, I, don't, I pay my part-time people a salary so I don't track their hours. Um, I pay my people at piece rate for, you know, how many things they've welded during the day, that kind of thing. So Bryden touched a little bit on how you would track their hours if, you're not, if they're not punching a pay clock, right? Um, when it comes to um, when it comes to new hires, one of the points that we like to point out. So keep in mind, you have to make friends with your payroll people, because um, you know, and it depends on you know sort of how many people you're hiring. So if you're hiring a hundred people in a month, you could have to do this on a rolling 12-month basis, on, every, on a daily basis, to look at a report and says, OK, on March 7th last year, you know, how many people did I hire? And of those people who my intent was part-time, did they work 30 hours, yes or no? So we want you to, we recommend that you roll, from a measurement perspective, you roll everybody to the first of the month. And I'll get, that, I'll get to those other points soon. I'm kind of running out of time here. so. So I skipped over new hires who you know are going to be full time. But the slide 17 talks about new hires who your intent is to hire them on a variable hour or a part time basis. So you do not cover those, those people from a medical plan. You don't even offer them coverage. And, and Bryden can jump up later if I'm, if I'm saying anything wrong. But 
you know, we would recommend don't offering them coverage, but you better daggone well have a process that starts to measure them and then verifies whether or not they're a full-time employee or not. We'll talk about that. And I am a visual person, so um, slide 18 talks about that same process with ongoing people. We like to put it visually. So on slide 19, there's a picture, right? So this is my initial measurement and stability period for a new person. Um, I'm going to hire this person in this example on October 15th. I'm going to roll their measurement period forward to start everybody on the first of the month. So I don't have to run a report from payroll every single day. I can at least do it on a rolling monthly basis. I'm going to measure that person for a 12-month period. And then I'm during this administrative period of November 1st to the end, during November, I'm going to take a picture and look back and say, did, I, did Christy work more than 30 hours, yes or no? If the answer is yes, I'm going to offer her coverage in that red box, the stability period. If the answer is no, I'm not going to offer her coverage in that stability period. And this is the same concept for ongoing employees. But what we recommend is that you, you, you start to line up with your, with your plan. So the easiest way to describe this, if, you, if you're working on a calendar year, so if you're, uh, if you're, if you're Benefits period runs during a calendar year. This would be the example that we would roll out to our clients. So, and this is this is a, a not etched in stone, but this is an example. So, your standard measurement period, you would back it up a month, right? So, your your coverage period is the calendar year. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to back up a month on November 1st, 2012, and start measuring. And then I'm going to give myself this administrative period, which is really the 60 days in this example for November and December, which kind of lines up with my open enrollment period. So I'm going to measure, and then during my open enrollment period, I'm going to offer all of those people who pass the test, do you work more than 30 hours, yes or no, I'm going to offer them coverage. And then the coverage is going to roll during my normal um, medical plan cycle. So in this example, a calendar year. And then this is my last slide. Um, I just wanted to kind of lay this out. So it's difficult to see. And this is only one page of about a 30-page report that we do for our clients. But essentially what we do is we take your census, right, of every single employee, part-time, full-time, whatever you call them, we look at hours worked, we look at rate of pay, and we look at current coverage. And then we, this model actually helps, um, we assume that each employee is going to make a rational decision. And so each employee, exactly, he's laughing in the back. So each employee either has to decide, do I stay on my health plan? Do I waive coverage and pay an individual penalty? Do I go into a Medicaid plan if I qualify? Or do I go into the exchange and buy coverage? And so, you know, in this example, there's about 1,500 employees. I've got some people going to Medicaid because they qualify from an income perspective. I've got some people going to state-based exchange. I've got some people who used to waive coverage that are now coming onto my plan because they don't want to pay the individual penalty. And of course, that's going to depend on what I'm charging my employee. Um, and that's what I was talking about with a rational decision. If I I'm charging a lot for my employer plan, and they want to waive coverage and only pay a $95 individual penalty, then it may make sense for them just to waive coverage and, and, and pay the penalty. But the great thing about this model is it shows what would happen if, everybody, if I just totally drop coverage and I want to pay that $2,000 per person non-tax deductible fee. And it shows what, what would happen if I also said, you know, Bryden showed the slide at the very beginning that showed that the total cost was about $11,000. Employee paid only about 2000 of that. So what if you switch that on its head and you said, okay, employee, you're going to go into the exchange, and I, the employer, am going to pay $2,000 into the exchange on your behalf, and then you have to pick up the additional $9,000. So if I drop coverage, I essentially just cut your benefits, your, your total compensation by $9,000. So are you going to hang around and continue to work hard for me, or are you going to 
you know, is this just the reality? That's the kind of thing that we're going to look at. So it does take into effect tax consequences. There is tax deductibility of, of medical plan claims. You lose that, possibly, if people go to the exchange. You lose that if you drop coverage. Um, but we think this is a pretty good estimator of all the moving pieces. And again, this is a 10-year projection. That red box is 2014. So that's all I've got. Billy or Ken, whoever is listening in to help with our tech, we can go now to the question and answer period where all the mics in the room are on. And we open up now to any questions that you all might have following on these, these remarks. Yes, sir. Is there going to be additional information regarding affordability because box one is after pre-tax deduction. So you're actually paying the employee more than what is recorded in box one. The proposed rates address that and acknowledge in the preamble that that's right. I mean, it is that is the rule. So it's nine and a half percent of of their after-tax. Right, not taking into account 401k or cafeteria plan contribution. Or their insurance rate. Right. Seems so. Yes. How do you see HSAs um, being, are they just going to go away or are they going to become more prominent with this? The question is a very good one, uh, asking about health savings accounts. And uh, I was also wondering if you could respond not only to Marcy's questions about how this will all impact HSAs, but uh, for those who maintain HSAs, how do they take that into account in determining whether the plan that you're offering is requiring more than 9.5% of the employee's household income? Well, I think Brian touched on that with the high deductible plan. I mean, that's the issue is whether those plans are going to meet the 60% um, actuarial value test. Don't you think? I mean, that's the... Yeah, and, and, and one, of the, one of the guidelines that just came out is actually um, self, larger self-funded plans, which I don't know all of you, but you're probably part, most of you are part of that. <clears throat> and so you get away from some of the rules about this um, minimum coverage standards and things like that. But one of the things that you are going to be held to is uh, a max out-of-pocket um, maximum, if you want to, if you want to say it that way, um, it, uh, and and that's set at the same rules at the health savings account maximum is, which this year is six thousand two hundred fifty dollars, and so um, you know, and the rules, the regs actually say that copays and things like that have to start applying towards the maximum out of pocket. So that's the thing I think from a coverage perspective, large plans are going to kind of bump up into more than anything, but. I don't see the actual savings account component of that going away. Um, you know, it's it's what has happened over the years is that that's that's the way people are going. Um, it's a great thing for young, healthy, you know, people, and it's also a great thing for higher income people who get that tax deductibility of funding that savings account. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, we look at you know statistics with the with the banks that we work with and some of them say as much as 50 percent of that money does not get touched so you know there's a lot of dollars in those accounts now um, and, and you know we don't see anything um, in terms of the actual savings account and that incentive you know that's really what's what's making the people put those in place is that you know all of a sudden you know, it's become a it's my dollars, my rules kind of a world in, in healthcare. And so, um, you know, for me to put a, a plan design in place like that that makes you think about what you're going to spend your healthcare dollars on because it's your money until you hit an out of pocket number, I think that's kind of the wave of the future, you know, for people to become more accountable for their own health. So I, I don't, but. Legislatively, I don't see anything happen with those accounts. 
<coughs> Any other questions? Greg? It's probably probably nothing here, but I've had a couple of employers with 100 employees or so who um, basically have a minimal out of pocket for their employees and they cover everybody. But they still have a fair good, fairly good number of people who won't pay the $10 a month and just opt out. Is there any concern there? Is there anything there? Well, they're offering the coverage. As long as the coverage complies, you can't, it doesn't matter if they, if those employees will have a decision in 2014 as to whether they want to be subject to the individual mandate. And they'll have more of an incentive, other than $95, 1% of household income is a lot of incentive. But increasingly over the years, that, that phases in, and they'll have more of an incentive to enroll in the plan. Let me pick up on that one and give another scenario. Uh, assume that you have uh, an employer, say, in the hotel industry, but perhaps has 500 full-time employees during the course of the year. They really are what we would consider full-time employees, but there's a lot of turnover. Many of them don't even stay, say, 90 days. And the employer does offer at least a bronze plan, but Many of these employees just do the math in their own heads and they determine uh, many of them, say a couple hundred of them, will not uh, take up the, the offered coverage. Is there any uh, penalty for that employer as long as they are at least offering the bronze plan? As long as they offer it. Yeah. And, and with an employer kind of with high turnover, if you remember the, the rules for var var new variable hour seasonal employees, um, those employees, you don't have a look-back period because they haven't been, they're new employees. And so you can have this initial measurement period of up to 12 months. Well, if you have a lot of turnover, uh, a lot of those seasonal and variable hour employees, they terminate employment before they get to the end of the measurement period. And so you never have to worry about them. So there's no penalty with a variable hour employee or a seasonal employee um, if you do not offer coverage during that initial measurement period, which can be up to 12 months, up to their, the anniversary of their date of hire. So... You know, I think an employer like that is going to get some relief because those employees are going to come and go, and they're not going to get to the become eligible for the plan because you're, they're still in their initial measurement period. But I will say, you know, when you think about variable hour employees, if you remember the rule is if I hire, if we hire Mark as a full-time employee, um, then we have to offer coverage within three months. So the first three months we get a pass, but after three months we have to offer them coverage. If we're not sure, if we hire Mark as a variable hour employee, um, so we're not sure how many hours whether he's going to meet that 30 hour per week standard, then we have that relief up to a year. Well, an employer who, who does that, I think, really needs to have, um, and I, Brian, I think, touched on this, processes in place and documentation. Because we don't want Mark going to an exchange in six months qualifying for coverage, and then we get a notice that we have a penalty. And then we're in a fight here. Well, no, you. Mark's a variable hour employee. Well, he says he's a full-time employee. He understood that he was hired as full-time, and he's been working 40 hours a week. You know, um, So you don't want to be in that that situation. So if you're going to rely on that variable hour relief or seasonal employee relief, um, it's got to be really well documented that on the date of hire, you know, it's well understood that this person was hired as a variable hour employee and will be subject to the, to the uh, initial measurement period. You should probably document everything the day you offer it. Yeah. That's and everything, I mean. I agree with that comment. Documentation from the get-go is something that you can show the employee has seen, maybe have them initial or sign off that they received a copy of what you provided to them. Of course, I'm speaking of an old paper technology when I just expressed what I expressed, and we all know that so many things are online, but then again, you just have them uh, click on the appropriate box in some way. Uh, have a way that you can produce and report and disclose to the government or whoever you need to show that you have had this conversation and you've communicated the data on such and such a date in such and such a way. I guess you could, if you do it electronically, you can get a receipt. You could. Uh, he, he was saying uh, you could get a receipt if you do it electronically. There, there are ways technically to figure this out. I have engineering friends who say for every, every engineering problem, there's an engineering solution. So yes, there should be some way that you can get the documentation. But as Bryden and Brian are both saying, you have to be thinking about this as you go into it. You have to be prepared and, and have your system already thought through. And then there should be a straightforward way to 
get it done. Right. We need systems in. We need put document plan documents have to be amended and summary plan descriptions have to be revised because this is an entirely new way of identifying eligible employees. Ed? Does the affordability testing apply to just the employee portion or to the family coverage as well? Employee only coverage. The question was whether the affordability testing applies to both the employee and uh, the family. And for the family coverage, what are the rules as we now understand them? Is there any affordability test and how is that uh, the applied? The affordability is on, on single only coverage. You have to offer coverage to dependents. But the nine and a half percent is not measured against the family coverage. So you can charge them more? Yeah, and, that, and right. So when you're thinking about, uh, my example was a 10% increase, and you're thinking how to, you know, redistribute part of that back to the employee base. You know, if you're at your limit from employee only, well, and you got to get it from employees, and it's going to start going towards the family. I mean, and that's not a that's not a new concept, I and mean, that's been happening for years. And as well as people getting a lot harder on, you know, putting spousal carve outs. If you have, if your spouse has coverage offered somewhere else, they cannot come on, you know, our plan. Doing, you know, dependent eligibility audits. You know, you've got, you've got the kids on. Are they really your children? Is that really your spouse? I mean, people are getting. Like I said, it's kind of like my money, my rules world, and people are getting a lot. Uh, stricter about that kind of thing. Take care of your employees first, and then, boy, if we can help families, that would be great. Some people think that way, and some people don't don't worry about that. Yes. Have you received any inquiries about altering corporate structure to essentially segregate a group of um, employees that are currently full time and offered a mini med plan? into a separate corporate entity to minimize, putting, putting it on discrimination testing aside to uh, minimize the <laughs> penalty. <laughs> we have, I mean, we've had inquiries about whether, for more than one client, whether we can avoid being a large employer by splitting up. But if you remember the control group slide, it doesn't work because we're going to look at the entire group. But the strategy that may work until we get the 105H non-discrimination, um, the Affordable Care Act, uh, makes the, the non-discrimination rules that apply to self-insured plans apply to insured plans. We're waiting for regulations for that to become effective. But insured plans will not be able to discriminate in favor of high compensated individuals. Putting those aside, as you said, it may be possible, you know, we, we treat, to, to determine whether you're an applicable large employer, we look at the entire control group. But then you may have a strategy where you comply, you know, the, the, the penalties are applied on an entity by entity basis. So you have a four member control group, they're all considered together to determine status, but then they're tested separately for compliance. So you could have um, you know, one group that doesn't offer coverage and pays a penalty, and you could have this this division that offers, you know, the lowest plan, and you could have this group over here offers a platinum plan. So you could have different compliance strategies within members of the control group. But then I think the non-discrimination rules, once those rates are issued, that could blow that strategy out of the water. How soon do we think we may see those new regulations for the non-discrimination rules as it applies to PAPACA? I may have heard someone say we could get them by June, but I've been hearing uh, that about the cafeteria plan rates for, for four years now. So I don't believe any of, that, any of those predictions. It's a little different issue, but I, I have a lot of clients who... Um, you know, they may put in a 12-month measurement period, but they're much more actively managing hours, you know, so, uh, and they're pushing it down to a manager level to say, look, you know, you've got every month or two, kind of go in and check and see, you know, is anybody crossing that 30-hour threshold, and if they are, you know, cut them back. So when we finish the testing period over the 12-month <coughs> period, we can, we can average things out and you know, be, be uh, satisfied that all of your folks are going to be under the 30-hour mark. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of, um, I mean, this, like, this is Eastern North Carolina, but, you know, you, we're going to shift workers over here and shift work. You know, there's, you know, people are friendly competitors down there, and they're talking about kind of moving people around on a part-time basis. And, you know, so you, 
which I think happens today. You may have somebody working two or three jobs and not getting benefits anywhere. So there's a there's a lot of manipulation going around on the rules. Well, good questions. Do you have any others? I have a question for Brian. <laughs> I've heard a strategy that for an employer to say, I'm not going to worry about the 9.5%. Mm -hmm. All I have to do is beat the exchange. Right. So I can charge 10.5%, 11%, 12%, but as long as when I take into account the fact that my employees are going to purchase coverage pre-tax yeah. and the uncertainty with what the exchange is and, and what the kind of coverage the employees are going to receive through the exchange and the complexity to the employee of enrolling in the exchange, mm -hmm that the employer just has to make, the game really is just to make the plan, the employer's plan more attractive than right. the exchange, just to beat the exchange. That's that's a very common thought. I mean, and and, and that's that's why it, it gets so nebulous. So the last thing you want as a self-funded plan, really an insured plan as well, is to, to have your young people, you know, go off the plan and go into the exchange. And what, what our Milliman actuaries tell us is that Look, when underwriting goes away, the, the exchange rates, both for those kind of young, healthy companies that I described, but also for young, healthy individuals, are going to you know, increase probably 40%. So I think the play is, yeah, there's some wiggle room in there, and I don't think it's going to be that difficult for me to beat the exchange, because the, the thing that the employee has to go through, keep in mind, is, I'm over here in my employer you know, world, and my premium is heavily subsidized. And over here in the, in the exchange world, you know, I'm paying the whole, the whole rate. So I don't think it's a hard, I don't think it's going to be difficult to compete against that. I really don't. My question, I, I want to be sure I understand, it, it is the application for the exchange that triggers the pill, right? So that is your your response to that question essentially was if you can beat the exchange rate, they're not going to apply for the exchange. What? So you're not going to be subject to the pill. It's the subsidy. So if I go into the exchange and receive a subsidy, then I'm penalized. Right. Right. So if they never go to the exchange, you don't have a penalty in the and, first place. And if you get, are we far enough down the line to know that if if the employer gets the notice of the penalty? What happens then? What, what's the process for saying, wait a minute, I'm not subject to the penalty because I offer the, the plan? Right. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> okay. I, I, you know, my instinct is that this is going to be kind of settled, you know, almost with tax time. And, um, and so, you know, on a one-off employee penalty discussion and is there an appeals process? And, you know, I don't know. That's going to be... Interesting to learn. Stay tuned. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. We appreciate your being here today. As we can all see, there's still more to talk about down the road, and we will be presenting programs as we go to try to keep you up to date.